I started out as a youth in church, you know, with my mom. And then once I went to college, I was involved. And then I think right around the time my mom passed away in 2017, I began to question Jesus a lot. I can understand God and I can understand even the Holy Spirit, but why is this Jesus so important? And I'm like, all right, God, just show me. Show me does Jesus matter? 2021, I actually, I was in a relationship with a man I thought I was gonna marry. It ended up becoming a domestic violence situation. Um, and he ended up assaulting me and I ended up moving here. I had really, really bad anxiety. It was just that battle with everything that I'd been through. I was drinking and I was smoking and I was like, I, I just can't do this anymore. I need to find me again. When you grow up in church, it becomes more ritual, more religious activity. And when you come to Christ for yourself, it's different. Once I got to a place where I'm like, I'm in my word, it was the most beautiful experience. Even though I'd known about Jesus my whole life, for once, Jesus was more than that picture on my grandma's wall. As I recommitted myself to Christ, I just really wanted somebody that loved him as much as I did around me. It was like a craving. One day, I was sitting in traffic. I wasn't paying attention because I was so deeply talking to God, and the person in front of me like slammed. So I'm like, look up, and I see the Compassion logo on top of a Pathfinder. When I drove past Compassion, I just, I just felt warm. I just felt like something was like pulling me. If you put your faith in Jesus, I wanna invite you to be baptized today in this service, right now, in the clothes you're wearing, just like the Philippian jailer did. Do it for the one who died to save you. To really understand who Christ was and is for my life and for everyone, I'm like, I gotta go get baptized. That's when I felt like my new life really began. Now that I have this community, it's so empowering. It's been my firm foundation in a way. You just feel so much love. I auditioned for the journey with advice from my therapist. It almost really felt like a full circle moment for me from when I asked. God, like, why is Jesus so important? And now here I am telling the story of why Jesus is so important. He literally was like, I see that you guys can't do this on your own. So I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna walk this life and I'm going to overcome all of it. And then I'm going to show you nothing, literally not even death is something to be feared because I'm gonna rise. If you feel too far from Jesus, it's impossible. Jesus is constantly in pursuit of all of us. When Christ comes in and he offers new life, he offers to make you that new creation, to create in you a new heart, to transform you by the renewing of your mind. I'm talking all the best shiny, and not shiny in material, but shiny in the light. That love doesn't wait for you to take a certain step or a certain action other than saying, I believe in you. There's nowhere he won't meet you. And my challenge is just to ask him to help you believe you can get up and watch what happens. All right, who's glad to be in the house of the Lord now? Come on. Come on, there it is, there it is. All right, have a seat, everybody. Man, we're so glad to have you all here. I just love Dave's testimony. I love the fact that Jesus is now here, not stuck in a grave anywhere, and man, we'll be circling back to that. But friends, I'm really glad you're here. I'm really glad that you chose to celebrate Easter with us, and if you're brand new, we want you to know we've been praying for you to get here. I mean, no matter which one of our seven campuses you may be on or online, I got a friend in British Columbia who texted me last night, that man, we're gonna be watching the services today. So welcome, welcome, welcome everybody around there. But listen, can we just welcome all of our new folks who are with us here today? Let's welcome all the newcomers. 
Thank you for coming on every campus. Love you guys. Love you, and we're glad you're here. And for the first time, we're broadcasting our Easter service on four different radio stations. So let me welcome everybody who's listening to, to the service today on Bob Country 106.9, G100, Rewind 107.9, and Hot 98.3. That's probably all the listeners that are out there. Glad to have you with us, everybody. I had an elder tell me one time, I like all kind of music. I like everything, I like everything from country to western. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's kind of a narrow band there, bro. But you know what? Somebody told me I had a face that was made for radio. <laughs> so this is great, right? Finally made it. And can I just say congratulations, everybody. You are participating today in the largest gathering of celebration on planet Earth. <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. There is no political gathering, no national gathering, no sporting gallery that puts as many people together to celebrate one thing as we are when believers get together on Resurrection Day. And, and ever since the earliest days, a pastor of the church would stand in front of the fellowship and say, Christ the Lord has risen today. And then the church would respond like lions. He has risen indeed. And so Compassion Christians in Georgia, South Carolina, all over the Americas, Europe, Africa, Asia, all of our friends, Let's make this historic declaration one more time. I'll lead you follow. Christ the Lord is risen today. He is risen okay, that's about half awesome. Here we go. Christ the Lord is risen today. Come on, hit it. All right, let's thank God for the resurrection, everybody. Come on. Now, I think it's really important for us to note that Easter is not a religious celebration. It is a celebration of a historic event. It's just like Independence Day. Easter is a celebration of something that Jesus did in history in front of thousands of eyewitnesses 2,000 years ago in a specific place that changed our world for the better everywhere on this planet. His teachings have been embraced. And friends, there is more evidence for the historicity of the resurrection than anything you know about ancient history. More evidence, better evidence than anything you know about the Greek or the Roman or the Egyptian empires. But the big question today is, not just did Jesus rise from the dead. If you dig it all, there's compelling evidence for that. I think the most important question is, who rose from the dead? Now, I asked that question last night, and a little kid over here went, Jesus did. And I was like, welcome to big church, dude. Glad to have you, glad to have you with us, right? But, but I mean, the question is, what kind of man was Jesus? Was he approachable or elitist, like so many of the leaders in our world today? Was he loving or ruthless? like all of the other rulers in the ancient world, and frankly, most of the rulers in our world today, and if you don't believe that, ask the folks in Ukraine about it. Was he merciful or merciless? Because I'm telling you, if Jesus was a ruthless, elitist, merciless man, he would have faded from history, just like all those other leaders in history who've been judged by history. And let me tell you, Jesus has been judged by history as well, judged and found to be the wisest, most loving, life-changing leader who has ever lived, biggest global impact of any human being in the history of the world. And, you know, unlike every other religion, followers of Jesus, we don't worship a dead hero. I mean, we don't do pilgrimages to a grave site where his body is, you know, moving toward dust because his body's not in a grave anywhere. Man, we do visit, you know, Jerusalem, take teams over to the, the garden tomb in Jerusalem, and I'm taking a group of Compassion Christians over there next year, and if you'd like to go, uh, email me, and we'll put you on the list. But the reason we go to this grave is because it's empty. Dude, it's been empty since the third day after Jesus was buried there because he rose from the dead, saw people, taught people, touched people, met and ate with his friends, gave a great commission that is still the engine that drives our church to this day and then ascended into heaven, uh, which we're going to talk about next week, and hope you'll come back for that. But do you remember when Day shared her testimony, she talked about getting hung up on Jesus. I mean, why is Jesus so important? You know, talking about God, that's general, but when you talk about Jesus, that's pretty specific. And I think she was onto something there, because listen, if you have the wrong image of Jesus in your head, it will cause you to dismiss the real Jesus because of a fake image in your mind. You know, theologian A.W. Tozer said, what comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. And I think that's true, because how you think about God determines how you believe he thinks about you. And what you think about Jesus determines what you believe he thinks about you. 
And if it sounds like I shifted gears on you there a little bit, well, it's talking about Jesus and then God and Jesus and God. Uh, that's, that's for real because Jesus said many times that he was God. I mean, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Uh, Jesus said in John 14, anybody who has seen me has seen the Father. And listen, this is either the ravings of a lunatic or a liar or somebody you better take very, very seriously. Because if you want to know what God is like, all you got to do is look at Jesus. And man, this is so important because you know what you think about Jesus it will determine if you ever trust him or not. And how much you trust Jesus will determine whether you give your life to Christ or not. And that decision is going to affect not just your life here on earth, but you know, through all eternity. So the big question in my mind today is, what is the picture that comes to your mind when you think about Jesus? And you know, we've all heard that a picture's worth a thousand words, and I absolutely believe that's true, uh, and I can prove it to you. Now, I hate to admit this, but I am getting older and older, and you know how old men are, the filters start fading, you know, we say stuff we probably shouldn't say. And I got in a conversation with this beautiful single woman in our church about a month ago, and man, when that conversation was over, I was so impressed with her. I mean, her faith and her wisdom and her courage that I was like, man, I've got a single nephew that lives in another state. I want to introduce you to him. <laughs> and you know, he's a single godly man. He's never married. He loves the Lord. He's professionally accomplished. He's tall and handsome. Y'all need to meet. And she looked at me and just busted out laughing, you know, which I thought was better than telling me off. But, but you know, if I told you I got a man you need to meet. What would be your first question? What would be your first question? You know what it is. Got a picture of him? <laughs> right? Because you're probably thinking, you know, what an old bald-headed preacher thinks is sharp and handsome uh, might be different than what I think, right? And then if I showed her a picture of me and him hunting in Montana and he's got blood all over him and it looks like some redneck hadn't seen a shower in a month, she'd be thinking, nope. <laughs> but you know what? That picture might lie to her because she wouldn't know from that picture that he's a godly man and highly educated and a gifted landscape photographer and a day trader and all of that, that picture in her mind might cause her to reject him before she actually even met him. Now, as we celebrate the miraculous resurrection of Jesus over death, hell, and the grave, I just want to make sure you got the right picture of Jesus in your mind. And I mean, even if you got drug in here today with two feet on the brakes, you know, when it comes to faith, I'm so glad you're here for Easter because Easter is the perfect picture of who God and Jesus are. Now, I bet you've actually heard some famous words that Jesus spoke to a skeptic, super skeptical guy, late at night, having a secret meeting, and Jesus is trying to explain to this dude why he came to earth, which we celebrated at Christmas, and then why he intended to go to the cross and die for our sins and rise from the dead, and he finally just tells this guy, look, man, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Listen, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now think about that. God sent his only son, Jesus, on a rescue mission so that anybody who puts their faith in him could be saved. He didn't come here mad. He didn't come here angry, gonna kick this thing to pieces, gonna condemn the whole world. Dude, he came here to save the world. He came here to conquer death so that anybody who wants to be saved can be. And if you don't want to, you won't be. But if you want to, Jesus has now made a way for you to be saved. And friends, that's the picture of Easter. I mean, when you accurately understand who Jesus is, you know exactly who God is. I mean, the Apostle Paul, you know, who was kind of a famous doubter, who became an all-in follower of Jesus, tried to, you know, break it down for us. He said, look, Christ, Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. In other words, you know, Jesus is the perfect picture of who God is right now. Now, friends, if that is true, why is it that so many of us, when we think about God, we don't have a picture in our mind of an all-powerful, unconditionally loving, exponentially creative teacher and leader who is patient and merciful to people who don't deserve it? Because that's the way Jesus was. I think the problem for many of us is that we already have another picture in our mind about who God is. Maybe because you bought into the lie your culture has told you about God. Can we be honest about that? Or even worse, 
for some of us, the reason that we don't have a correct picture of God in our mind, and it hurts me to say this, is because you have encountered some belligerent Christian online or at work or at a family reunion, and they are so obnoxious and judgmental that you incorrectly assume that all Christians are that way because God's that way. And that just ain't true. That's, that's the wrong picture. Somebody has done you a grave disservice. I mean, can we just admit today that there are some kooky Christians out there, amen? You know what I'm saying? There might be some in here too, all right? But there's kooky people at Target. You still go there, don't you? I'm just saying, I'm just saying. No, I mean, it's sad. I mean, it's kind of a heartbreaker. I, I talked to a family who was sitting right over there, right on that front row a few weeks ago. They were going to another church, serving another church, got their hearts broken by this thoughtless, immature pastor. I mean, I know I only heard one side of the story, but wow, church hurt is tough. It's tough. And I'll tell you what breaks my heart is to think that some of us grew up in a church environment where we were taught the wrong image of God. Certainly not the image that we find in the scripture. And man, I tell you, I've talked with too many people that that happened to them to believe that's not true. It's heartbreaking. On the other hand, for some of us here today, we got an inaccurate image of God in our mind because you built it. You built the one you wanted. Maybe you went through some painful trauma or abuse or just had a run of bad breaks, and who'd you blame for it? Not the world, the sin in the world? No, you blame God. Oh, this is God's fault. You blamed him. Maybe, maybe you projected a whole lifetime of pain and disappointment onto God, and friend, can I just tell you, that is not a correct image of who God is. I mean, I remember back when I was a kid, my family went through this horrible run. I mean, we got abused. I got abused by some kids when I was little. Uh, I, dude, I didn't see that coming. I was too little to do anything about it. But by God's grace, he put a stop to it. And then my father drops dead in the middle of the night when he's 43 years old. I'm 11. Left my mom without a husband, me and my brother without a dad. Brutal. I, I, we didn't know how we were going to make it. But by God's grace, we did. Then a few years later, my mom started dating this guy who turns out to be a psycho a stalker, I mean, it's me doing mean, illegal stuff to terrorize her. It got so bad that my mother would sit up through the night on the kitchen table with a shotgun across her knees, looking out the kitchen window, so afraid that that nut was gonna show up and do something to our family again. And uh, my mother was a country girl, you know what I mean? <laughs> she was prepared to arrange a meeting with that guy and Jesus right in front of the garage. <laughs> if he made the wrong moves, <laughs> I'm telling you. But that's how scared she was that something horrible was gonna happen to her or me or my brother. And God eventually answered her prayers and, and worked through law enforcement and put a stop to it, which is a really pretty cool story. I'd love to tell you, we'll tell you another time. But then my brother got in this terrible accident and he was bleeding so bad, we thought he was gonna bleed out. And then by God's grace, he didn't and praise the Lord. But you know, sometimes you go through those seasons like that where it's like boom, boom, boom. I mean, the hits just keep on coming. And I'm thinking, God, are you out to get me here? And I was so blessed to have a really perceptive pastor who visited with me and he reminded me, Kim, God's not out to get you, bro. He's here to save you. The world's out to get you. This world is rough. It is broken. It is run by sinful, selfish people. The world is a problem. He sent Jesus into this world to save you. And then he reminded me about how every one of those challenges, you know, God would send somebody in to help me or coach me or guide me or protect me or, you know, educate me a little bit, comfort me, you know, because years earlier Jesus had saved me. And, and that's the message of Easter. I mean, no matter what, who you are, no matter what you walked in here with today, you have a God who loves you, who sent his son Jesus to save you. And I think some of us need to just tear up some of the bad pictures that we have about God and Jesus in our mind today, and I wanna help you do that. I'm gonna give you four pictures that you may relate to about God, three of them really bad. <laughs> Wrong picture, uh, maybe you'll resonate with one of them, I don't know. But one of them is the right picture. And let me tell you what I've been praying since January. I've been praying that this Easter, hundreds of people across all of our campuses who have held off, I mean, stiff-armed Jesus because of some crazy picture you got of him in your head, will get the right picture in your head this Easter and move toward him in faith. I mean, I'm praying that many of us here today, like people have done after almost every one of our services, will put their faith in Jesus and give their life to him and be baptized into Christ today on Easter Sunday. 
because you made that decision today. That's what I've been praying. So let me show you some pictures of God. I want to thank my friend Ashley Woolard for helping me with this. I think when some of us think about God, this is what we think about. A huge, unclimbable, unsurmountable, insurmountable wall. Can't get through it, can't get over it, can't get around it. Uh, I mean, you, you're thinking about things that are so big, you just think, ain't no way in the world I can get past that. I mean, you're on one side, God's on the other, that's it. For some of us, it's because of our doubts. It's our doubts. And can I just say, doubt is normal. I mean, listen, we had a pastor on our staff who was an atheist, right? I mean, back when he was a kid, he struggled with all kinds of doubts, but somebody invited him to a church like this. He met a pastor there who he could talk to about all that stuff, found out, dude, there's an answer to every one of my doubts. That's why he became a follower of Jesus. That's why he's a pastor today. You don't really think God's afraid of your doubts, do you? I mean, if he's God, come on. Your questions will be easy to answer. He's been answering for a long time. There are good answers to every doubt if you have the courage to articulate it. Listen, doubt doesn't disqualify your faith. I mean, not as long as you've got the courage to go head to head with the truth. I mean, doubt can actually be your servant. It can make your faith even stronger. But maybe, maybe your wall is because of sin. You know, I've had people tell me from time to time, well, I could never become a follower of Christ because I have intellectual problems with the gospel. And I'm like, really? Do you? Because I've heard people say that a lot. I've never believed it. Never believed anybody. Because you dig down far enough and there's some autonomy issue. There's some pride issue. There's some fear, addiction, lust, illicit relationships. Something they know in their head is going to kill them eventually, but they just ain't giving it up. Maybe the wall for you is you don't think God cares about you. Maybe, maybe you feel betrayed by God because he didn't answer the prayer you prayed the way you wanted it pray, answered in the time frame that you needed it answered. And so you feel like he let you down. I'll tell you somebody else who's, who had that experience. It was, uh, what was his name? Jesus Christ. Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Lord, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. And you know, God said, nope. No way for you to save the world and, and not drink this cup. And Jesus is like, yes, sir. And he embraced it. But he didn't get his prayer answered the way he wanted it in the time frame that he wanted it either. So, I mean, if, if that's your problem, you could talk to Jesus. He gets it, man. He gets it. Uh, I think that uh, maybe some of us feel like God owes us something that he never actually promised you. But because you didn't get what you thought he owed you, there's this sense of disappointment. And it's like a wall between you and Jesus. And friends, if that's your picture, I just want to tell you, wrong picture. <laughs> wrong picture. I mean, maybe you grew up in a family where your parents didn't care. Or maybe somebody you really love abandoned you or disappointed you. Or maybe life has just been stinking hard for you and now you're projecting that onto God. But friends, can I just tell you, God never built a wall to keep you away from him. It's just the opposite. If somebody built a wall, you built it. You built it. And Jesus talks about this, right? Uh, he, he tells a story called The Prodigal Son. It's one of his most famous stories. It's about this great dad who's got this, you know, rebellious, entitled, you know, selfish son. And this son, you know, takes every good thing his dad has to give him and then just leaves town, blows all his money on partying. And then when the money runs out and life gets miserable, this kid starts reflecting, you know, on how good life was before I rejected my father and got everything I thought I wanted. And then when he hit the bottom, which is generally a really good thing, Hitting the bottom can be a good thing, clarifying. He thought to himself, you know, my dad's got employees who live better than I do, and I'm his son. This is crazy. I'm sick of this. I'm going home. And then he heads home, and all the way home, he's thinking in his mind, oh, I don't even know if I'll be able to find dad. I don't know if he'll talk to me, if he'll make an appointment with me. I'm going to have to beg. I'm going to have to grovel. And he's, he's playing out all these worst-case scenarios. You know why? Because he's got a bad picture of his dad in his mind. He's got the wrong picture in his mind. Because when he comes around the corner and there's the house, his dad's on the front porch waiting for him, looking for him, hoping he would come home. And Jesus tells us, you know, the dad represents God in this picture. And then the dad jumps off the front porch, runs out to this guy, throws his arms around him, welcomes him home. This would be unheard of in any other religion in the world. I mean, the only picture in the Bible of God being in a hurry is when he runs to extend love and acceptance and forgiveness to some sinful dude who finally came home. So, you know, if you feel like there's a barrier between you and God, let me tell you something. God is for you. 
He is for you. Only you can put up a wall between you and God and separate yourself from him. Now, there's an unexpected image of this embedded in the Easter story in Matthew 27. And it happens at the moment Jesus dies. It's pretty interesting. You may remember, it says when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. I mean, the very first thing happened after Jesus died is this big curtain in the temple in Jerusalem rips in half. And history tells us this curtain was as thick as your hand. I mean, this thing was immense. It was hung up in the Jewish temple as a, a symbol of the massive wall of separation that sin creates between man and God. And that wall just cut everybody off from the presence of God. Only the high priest could pass through that wall only once a year, only once in his lifetime to make a sin sacrifice for the people of Israel. But man, when Jesus gave his life on the cross as a perfect sacrificial lamb to pay for our sins, that temple curtain just spontaneously split in half to signify the fact that because of Jesus, nothing can separate you from the love of God if you are willing to accept the free gift of salvation. And did you notice it says it was torn from top to bottom? I mean, if men created that breach, it would have been from bottom to top, right? It's like the writer wants us to know God ripped it. God did it. He wanted you to know you have access to him. And if you're willing, you can come to him anytime. Which brings us to another image that I think is just a bad picture of God. And maybe it's because we're Americans, uh, you know, that we can um, get locked in on this a little bit. I think sometimes we think, you know, it's all about wins and losses with God, right? I mean, he's tallying things up. He's got that Excel spreadsheet on every one of us, you know. And God's like this divine accountant up in heaven, Right? I mean, many of us think of God like he's keeping score. And let me tell you, the good people go to go to heaven and the bad people don't. And God's constantly calculating and measuring all of our good deeds against our bad deeds. And man, as long as you're a good person, which I guess according to you, then you think you're gonna go to heaven, right? But the problem is the only way you can make that math work is by comparing yourself to the worst people you know. Well, you know when God compares you to somebody, you know who he compares you to? Jesus. <laughs> Anybody want to say, ouch? Because let me tell you, not many of us can compare very well to him. I mean, think about it. If you could get your sin cycle rate down to three sins a day, would that be an improvement for you? Three sins. Let me see the hands of everybody who thinks that would be an improvement if I only sin three times a day. Let me see. Oh, oh good, good, good. The rest of you liars, we'll get to y'all later on, all right? <laughs> but let me tell you, my sin rate gusts way, way up over three a day. I mean, three a day, you know, you disrespect your wife and you don't apologize for it. Uh, you go to work and get impatient with somebody, skin them up a little bit. Uh, you know, you come home and instead of, you know, talking to your kid, you watch some dumb golf tournament or something like that. Dude, I can do that in an hour, <laughs> you know. I mean, that don't take very long for me. But imagine, you, you know how many sins that would be if you committed three a day for a year? That's a thousand. And if you live to be 70, 80, 100 years old like some of you folks, no, I'm just kidding about that. If you live to be 70 years old, dude, you're gonna go before the divine accountant with 70,000 tax violations against your record. He's gonna be looking at you going, tough to be you. <laughs> Flush him, right? And you know, the point is, nobody's going to heaven on the I'm a good person plan because nobody can stand that spiritual audit. Dude, if you could, why would Jesus even need to die on the cross for our sins? He wouldn't have. But I'll tell you what the truth is. This is, what the Paul, this is what the Apostle Paul tells us. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, do you know what this word all means in the Greek language? Exactly the same thing it means in the English language. All. <laughs> Everybody. Me, you, your mama, your grandmama, Billy Graham, the Pope, whoever your heroes are, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then all are justified freely, what? By his grace, which means a gift. How? Well, through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now listen, somebody here needs to hear this today. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. Amen? Amen. Say it with me, everybody. Big voice, come on. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. Now you can see it as clear as day in this verse. I mean, what does it say? Everybody's failed. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, me, you, everybody. That's why we all need what Jesus did for us on the cross that comes to us freely by his grace. It says we're justified by grace. Justified means that when you are in Christ, and I'm not talking about having a religion or having your mama do something to you when you're a little baby and you can't even remember that. I mean, when you are in Christ, you have a relationship with Jesus, 
Justify means that he looks at you and it is just as if I'd never sinned. And that justification comes by grace as a gift when you have a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Now, you got to know the last thing in the world any of us need is a spiritual accountant because we already failed that audit. You are not a mistake maker who needs a life coach. You are a sinner who needs a savior. That's why the symbol on top of this building is not a ladder. It's a cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't say, get to work, everybody. He said, it is finished. I have paid the price for the guilt of all mankind. I'm doing all the heavy lifting right here on the cross. So I can give you this as a gift. Now, let me speak to somebody here today. Maybe you grew up in a family for whatever reason, probably not any fault of their own. They made you feel like you had to earn their love. I mean, you got to get those grades. You got to get on that ball team. You got to win, 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 win. And, and, and now you have projected that image onto God. And you've been trying to earn his love all your life. And can I just tell you something? You cannot earn God's love. And thank God you don't have to. Somebody say amen. amen. I mean, that's the good news right there, right? I mean, we got a God who loves us for who we are right now. And as hard as this is to believe, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. And there is nothing you can do to make God love you less. He loves you with an unconditional love right now. So if you've been thinking spiritually, <laughs> too late for me. <laughs> I mean, if I got started earlier, maybe. But I don't have enough life left to put any points up on the board to cover all of my sin. Wrong picture. Wrong picture. It doesn't work like that. Jesus came for you just as you are. He knew you and loved you enough to die for you, and he loves you too much right now to leave you the way you are. Which brings us to a, another picture, wrong picture, that pops into our heads sometimes when we think about God. And honestly, this picture right here is not about God, it's about us. It's about how we think about ourselves. You know, when God comes up and I'm thinking, oh my word, the mess. You, you don't know the mess I've made of my life. I think it might be, I might have gone too far. Because you think about all the junk and all the sin and all the messes that you created, and it just haunts us sometimes. So you think to yourself, well, God could never love me. I could never, if I went to God, he'd laugh. What are you doing here? He'd reject me. I mean, I, I, my life's a mess. And then you think, okay, well, well, maybe if I really hustle and I work really hard, I can clean my life up first, and then God will give me a chance and try it. Try it. Try that. <laughs> You'll find out what everybody else who's ever tried it has found out. It's impossible. Can't be done in your own strength. Can't do it. And if I could smash one image, one bad image of God, this would be the one right here. Because I think this picture was developed in hell by the devil because he knows how we think. What's the devil's greatest tool against you? You ever thought about that? Number one, lies that he tells you to get you to do things that you know are wrong. That's what we call temptation. When you believe a lie from Satan that tempts you to do stuff that you know is wrong. And then when you do it, what does Satan do? Oh, that was awesome, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, no, he's like, loser, sinner, cheater, liar, screw up. Look what you did. Oh, ah, ah. And he just keeps pumping this stuff at us over and over to shame us. And he wants to shame us until we think, well, I'm the worst one. I'm the only one. God could never accept me. I've done too much. I've done it too bad. I've done it too long. I've gone too far. And if that's what you're thinking today, dude, wrong picture. <laughs> wrong picture. Listen, Jesus came to earth and died on the cross and rose again for the very people who had made such a mess of their life. Have you read the New Testament? It's awesome. You should read it. Look at who Jesus hangs out with. He hangs out with people who are weak and who have problems and who have sin that has just trashed their life. In fact, the fancy religious people attacked him for that. And then Jesus said, hey, it's not the healthy who need a doctor. It's the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Do you know why he said this last line? Because there are no righteous. You've got to be delusional to think you're going to earn your way to heaven. I mean, let me, let me ask you three questions. I can, I can dispossess you of that, all right? But there are no righteous in our own strength. Paul, Paul's right, man. Nobody gets it right all the time. 
Nobody can pass that moral audit that we talked about a minute ago. Everybody has a sin problem that only Jesus can solve. But the problem is when we get together like this, we look so good, you know? I mean, look how everybody's cleaned up for Easter. Awesome. You guys are looking good, man. And you know what's possible? It's possible to walk in here and think, dude, I'm the only one here that's messed up. All these folks got their stuff together. I'm the only one here who's blown it. And can I just say, wrong picture. Wrong picture of the people of God, amen? Hey, here's the right picture right here. Y'all seeing this? This is the right picture right here. We, just because we cover the sin up doesn't mean it's not there, right? Just because you can't see it from the outside doesn't mean we're not messed up. I mean, look at this. Look at this one right here. Ooh. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not even sure that's a sin, but some people, some people think it is. You know. And so I thought just to humble myself, I would put some of Pastor Harrison's sins on my shirt here today. So you, <laughs> you learned them from your dad, did you? Is that right? Okay, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. But, you, but listen, man, this is reality. There, there's nobody in this church that has more of a problem with sin than I do. I mean, nobody. I don't, I don't know who you think you are or who you think I am. I mean, there's one perfect guy. His name was Jesus, not, not Cam. And we all have sin that we're struggling with all the time. And we're going to fight this fight until we get to heaven. But here's the good news. The good news is that Paul says, in Christ, now again, if you have a relationship with Christ, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God. Now, let me make a clarification because I know people are confused about this. Everybody is not a child of God. Everybody is a creation of God. Everybody is loved by God. Only people who are in Christ are children of God. You need to be clear about that. No, no, no false hope here, all right? In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God. How does that happen? By putting your faith in Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Think about what that means. I mean, God knows we're weak. He knew we were weak when he sent Jesus to save us. He knew we would mess up. I mean, that's, that's living in this world, in, in this physical body, right? I mean, in this world, we're gonna struggle all the way. But man, when you give your life to Christ, it says you are clothed with Christ. And so when God looks at you, he didn't see all the mess Man, he sees Christ. He sees your relationship with Christ. It's awesome. Listen, if you could clean all this stuff up on your own, Jesus wouldn't have had to die on a cross for your sin. I had somebody come up to me after the service last night. Pastor Cam, you would never lie, would you? I was like, oh, Lord. I'm getting ready to right now. You know? but, but, you know, hey, what's the worst lie? What's the worst lie? The lie you tell yourself. Have you ever met anybody who doesn't lie to themselves? I haven't. <laughs> I hadn't met a soul. And so I'm just saying, listen, man, we can't clean this stuff up. If we could, it would be awesome. We couldn't. And so Jesus died for us so he could save us. And because that forgiveness cost him so much, if your faith is real, though you will never become sinless till you get to heaven, in this life you will sin less and less and less out of gratitude to the Lord who gave his life to save you. So those are three wrong pictures of God. What's, what's the right picture? What, what's the right image? You should see God as a giver of extraordinarily expensive gifts that are free to you. You should think of a father who gives extraordinarily expensive gifts that are free to you. Now, now, now watch how clear this is in Scripture. Paul says, the wages of sin is death, but that, say it with me, everybody. The free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, eternal life is not something you can earn or deserve. You never will. It's a gift. It comes by grace from God because he wants to save you from the consequences of your own sin. That's why he sent Jesus. You, listen, you can receive this gift today, but you will not unless you decide to receive it. It's available. But if you don't receive it, you'll die without it. Now, I've asked my granddaughter to come help me illustrate this a little bit. Where's my granddaughter? There she is, Emma Grace. Y'all welcome, Emma Grace. She's rolling out here to help Papa with the sermon. Okay, baby. You know, there's 2,000 people in here. That means 4,000 eyeballs, so she's courageous, right? All right, here she is. All right, so Emma Grace, let's pretend that you are you, and that I am God, and I have this amazing gift of eternal life that I want to give you, okay? So, Emma Grace... Jesus came to earth and died so that you could have this gift of eternal life. Would you like to have this? 
Baby, listen, this is super expensive. Jesus died on the cross. Here, take this. This is yours. <laughs> Emma Grace, please, you need this. If you don't receive this gift, our relationship is going to get broader and wider and weaker and weaker. Please, baby, take this gift. Emma Grace, you have to take this gift to be saved. Please. Can you imagine how I would feel as a dad or a grandfather if I offered my daughter or my granddaughter a precious gift and she just rolled her eyes at me and walked off? Can you imagine how God feels when people hear about this amazing gift that Jesus made available for them by dying on the cross and rising from the dead and they just roll their eyes and walk off? Can you imagine how God feels about that? Friend, please don't let Easter be a picture in your mind of God offering you this priceless gift that you cannot earn and do not deserve. You just chucking it back in his face, justifying that rejection by saying, well, I got doubts. Okay, let's talk about it. Come on, man, sit down with somebody who knows some answers and let's talk about your stinking doubts. Well, Cam, I made such a big mess in my life. I don't think God would love me. Yes, he does. He knew all about the mess you made out of your life long before he sent Jesus to save you. Listen, you don't think God ever looks down from heaven and goes, can you believe what she just did? <laughs> no, that's what your parents do. God already knew, all right? <laughs> God already knew. So let's talk about these doubts. Let's talk about this mess. And then, okay, okay, you got me. What do I need to do? How, how do I receive this gift of eternal life? Easy as ABC. Now, you got to receive it. The A says, A stands for admit. Everybody say admit. Admit, admit you got a sin problem only Jesus can solve. Get honest for the first time in your life. Admit the sin that you have committed has separated you from God. Be honest and admit what you and God and everybody who knows you already knows. Listen, theologian Paul Tripp said, if you minimize your sin, you will never seek the amazing grace that's yours in Christ Jesus. So stop minimizing and admit. The B stands for believe. Believe Jesus is the answer to your sin problem and ask him to be the Lord and Savior of your life. Put your faith and trust in Jesus, not in some religious ceremony that your parents had done to you when you were a little baby you can't even remember, not in good works, which are crazy to start off with. Put your trust in a relationship with Jesus. Talk to him. He's alive. He hears. Pray to him. Talk to him. Tell him you have a sin problem. Ask him to be the forgiver of your sins and the leader of your life. And then commit your life to Jesus by repenting of your sins and being baptized into Christ. You know, repentance means to be willing to change. It doesn't mean you change automatically all just like that. But it means you're willing to change, which means you walk in a direction and you finally realize, whoa, this is wrong. This hurts. This is bad. This is not good for anybody. But rather than just push it on through, which we've all done a thousand times, you stop and you turn back 180 degrees and you start moving in the right direction. And here's the cool thing about repentance. The longer you move in the right direction, the stronger you will become and the more Christ-like you will look. It won't happen in one day, but dude, that process is amazing. And then baptism is frankly just an image of what we're celebrating here today. Listen, baptism is a drama in which you get to play the part of Jesus in a, in a re, you know, reenactment of the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. I mean, think about it. When you saw somebody be baptized a minute ago, when you go under the water, it's just like when they laid Jesus in the tomb. And while you're under the water, your eyes are closed. You're not breathing. You're trusting somebody else, just like Jesus for three days was dead in that tomb. And then, man, when you come out of that water, bursting out with new life, it's just like when Jesus came out of the grave. And you come out with new life because you are now putting your trust in him not your good works, not religion, not anything else. Friends, there is not a single example of anybody coming to Jesus after his death on the cross and resurrection who was not immediately baptized into Christ. Have you done that? Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible. Read the New Testament. Have you done what people did in the New Testament? Been baptized into Christ on the basis of your faith? You know, Paul wrote about this. He said, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. Now, friends, you need to realize something. Jesus did not come to this planet to make bad people good. That's the wrong picture. He came to this planet to make dead people come to life. 
spiritually dead people come to life. And it happened for day. Happened for me. Could happen for you too. Now take a look at this card that was on your seat when you came in today. This is a seed card. Now this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. You can take this little card and put it in a pot of dirt and water it and it'll start growing stuff. It's crazy. I mean, you should try this. Don't try it when you get home. If you put this in a nice pot of dirt, water a little bit, one week from today, this is what you'll see. And another week or two later, and this is what you'll see. And the longer you leave this and you care for it and you nurture it, the more flowers will grow in that pot. Now, I talked to a guy back here when I was getting ready to baptize uh, those folks a minute ago, Tommy. <clears throat> Tommy gave his life to Jesus 10 years ago today. On Easter Sunday, 10 years ago, he gave his life to Christ and was baptized into Christ on Easter Sunday. And he is still here serving. The look on his face has changed. The condition of his heart changed the day he gave his life to Christ. But let me tell you, that brother's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And that could happen for you. But you've got to decide. You've got to decide if you will receive this gift or not. And we're praying that you will. Father, thank you for this time we've had to talk about what Jesus did for us on the cross and the power of his resurrection and the difference that's made in our world. And I pray, God, that it'll make a difference in somebody's world here today. That just like at this service, just like all the other services we've had, that there will be people who will make a decision to commit their lives to Christ. Lord, they will admit they have a sin problem that has to be dealt with, that they can't deal with, that they will... Lord, believe that Jesus' death on the cross was for them and they will commit themselves to Christ by repenting of their sins and being baptized into Christ. And then the adventure begins. And I pray it will begin for somebody here today. And we pray this in Jesus' strong name and all God's people said, amen. <clears throat> amen.